Hi, hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, that woman who everyone seems to think hates men when she really just hates men who assault people. And with that intro of intros, I am back with another Women's History Month episode, part two of Euripides' The Phoenician Women, the play that reimagines Sophocles' more famous play, Oedipus Tyrannos, and his Antigone and Aeschylus' Seven Against Thebes, and says, hey, what if Jocasta actually had a role to play in her own tragedy? Last week, we began our story in the city of Thebes, at the beginning of what is often called the Seven Against Thebes, for the Aeschylus play by that name. Euripides' Phoenician Women tells, in essence, the story of that Aeschylus play and Sophocles' Antigone. Euripides just concerns himself with other aspects, like Jocasta. Jocasta, in this telling, is very much alive and very much still a powerful and respected royal figure in the city of Thebes. Oedipus, meanwhile, is locked away, hidden from the city, so that they might, I don't know, forget that he killed their king, cursed their town, and inadvertently married his own mother? Polynices, one of Jocasta's two sons, has been in self-imposed exile in Argos, intending to return to Thebes to take his turn on the throne. But his brother, Ateocles, has backed out of their deal and refuses to give up his place on the throne. Thus, Polynices has returned with an army from Argos to wage war on his brother and on his own city. The city of Thebes, quite famously, has seven gates in the walls surrounding the city, and Polynices has generals stationed at each one. Jocasta has done her utmost to stop her sons from going to battle against one another, but they're stubborn, they both want power, and neither of them wants to admit defeat. Thus, Polynices left the meeting with his mother and brother and headed back to his Argive army, and Ateocles has left to prepare his own to defend the city, with the guidance of Jocasta's brother, Creon. This is episode 117, The Heroines of Thebes, Jocasta and Antigone, The Phoenician Women, Part 2. With war between brothers, between Thebes and Argos, imminent... The chorus of Phoenician women stuck in Thebes by that very inevitable battle lament the mess they're all in. Ares, why do you love blood and battle as much as you do, they ask. Why can't you distract yourself with dancing, with drinking wine? Why, instead, are you urging the Argives against us? Oh, they go on, oh, what might have been if Oedipus had never been brought to that mountain, if he'd never been brought up in Corinth and returned to Thebes. Oh, what might have been if the Sphinx had never plagued the town with her riddles. Tiresias then arrives, the famed blind prophet of Thebes. He's brought in by his daughter and by Creon's son, Menechius. Creon, who remained on stage when Ateocles left and the Phoenician women began their lament, greets Tiresias, grateful for his help. At Creon's urging, Tiresias begins to tell him and the others what exactly is going so wrong in Thebes. 
there's a curse for one, something no one should be surprised by. But what is the curse? Oedipus himself was cursed by what Laius did, having a child even when the oracle warned him against it. But Ateocles and Polynices cursed themselves further when they hid their father away rather than letting him escape the city and into exile. They made him angry, spiteful, and he cursed them. And it's only going to get worse, Tiresias continues. The brothers will kill each other, but that too is only the beginning. So many Argives and Cadmians will die at each other's hands. The city itself will crumble under the weight of it all. At least all this will happen if they don't listen to what Tiresias has to say. No one of Oedipus's blood should remain in the city, is Tiresias's instruction in an effort to prevent the curse from taking further hold. Or, he adds, there's another option, but it's not for him to say. Creon, of course, presses Tiresias to disclose the other option the Thebans have to save themselves, but Tiresias is hesitant. He asks that Creon's son, who brought him there, Manichius, leave them before he speaks. But Creon pushes back, saying that his son can be trusted. He can stay. Finally, Tiresias gives in, agreeing to explain the further prophecy to Creon, with Manichius still nearby. You have to kill your son, Manichius, Tiresias explains quite bluntly. He'd done his best to avoid having to say it, and even more to avoid saying it in front of the boy. Creon doesn't want to hear this. He can't believe that this would be the prophecy to save the city. He thinks he hasn't heard him right, or that he's misunderstanding. Finally, just says, no, we don't need you at all. We don't need your prophecies. To which Tiresias responds, quote, Is the truth to be lost because your luck has changed? Creon presses Tiresias about this prophecy. Why his son? Why must it be Manichaeus killed to alleviate some of the curse on Thebes? Tiresias explains how it must be done, and that it's part of an ancient anger that Ares had with Cadmus, who killed his dragon on the spot where he founded Thebes, sowed the seeds and grew the Spartoi, the men of Theban earth, from which they're all descended. Creon, it seems, is one of the last whose blood is purely from the sown men of those dragon teeth. Both his parents were descended from them, and there are no more like him, so it must be his child sacrificed to appease the anger of Ares and get him on their side. He goes on to explain that it can't be Creon's other son, Hymon, because he's set to marry Antigone. Of course, the death of Hymon is a vital aspect of Sophocles' famous play, Antigone. Tiresias makes it all very clear to Creon, quote, Save your son or save your city. With this, Tiresias asks his daughter to lead him away. He isn't happy about having had to express this prophecy or happy to have the gift of prophecy at all, especially in moments like this one. Creon, for his part, refuses to take his son's life, even to save his city. He's willing to die for it, he says, but not to kill his own son. I'm not sure if it's meant to be a commentary on Agamemnon, but given Euripides did write a major tragedy about the sacrifice of Iphigenia, it certainly might be. Creon really dwells on it, how impossible it would be for him to kill his son, how it's a way of life to love your children that he simply could never. Instead, he tells Manichaeus to flee the city and go as far as he can, to Aetolia and beyond. At Manichaeus' urging, Creon leaves to get his son some gold to take with him, to get him as far as possible, to allow him to escape the city and his fate. Before he leaves, though, Manichaeus tells Creon that he will go and say goodbye to Jocasta, bringing her back into the story with unexpected importance, because he tells the audience that Jocasta nursed him her nephew, when his own mother died. Once more, Jocasta is being praised as someone vital to the city and to her family. With that statement made, Creon leaves. But with Creon gone, Manichaeus addresses the chorus, and he has other plans. He isn't going to leave. 
He isn't going to take what he sees as the coward's way out. If it's only his death that can save his beloved city, he's going to make it happen. He is willing to sacrifice himself for Thebes. Quote, I will go now to stand upon the highest tower and immolate myself into the deep, dark den of the dragon where the prophet directed, and I will preserve the homeland. With only the chorus left on stage and the impending tragedy revealed to the audience, the Phoenician women lament what has happened to the city of Thebes and to its people. They lament the arrival of the Sphinx and all the damage she caused. She killed so many Thebans, but even in her death, she caused more curse to reign upon the city. They lament the dragon of Ares that Cadmus killed, that spawned Ares' anger at the Cadmians and the Thebans. They lament Oedipus and all his woes, all the tragedy he brought with him in his very existence and in his return from Corinth to Thebes and all that resulted. They lament the very beginning of the curse, the death of Ares' dragon, Athena spurring Cadmus to found the city there in the first place. With this, time passes, the whole day if not longer, and a messenger arrives, calling for Jocasta. Returning to the stage from the palace, Jocasta fears the worst. Is the messenger here to tell her of the death of her son, Eteocles, or Polynices? But no, he's not there with that news, nor to tell her that any of the seven gates of Thebes have been breached. He is, though, there with news of tragedy. The messenger tells Jocasta about Manichaeus, that he sacrificed himself for the city, standing on the highest tower of Thebes and thrusting his own sword through his throat, all in the name of his city, all for the survival of Thebes. Without giving Jocasta any lines to process this news, the death of a boy she nursed when his own mother died, who was like another son to her. The messenger goes on. He tells her that Eteocles has sent Thebans to defend the gates, and he tells of all the men the Argives have sent to attack their walls, their seven gates of Thebes. These seven men get lengthy introductions, as it is based off of an earlier epic poem, stories of their families, their armor, the crests on their shields. One had Atalanta taking out the boar, her most famous accomplishment, another Argus Panoptes and all his many eyes, one man brought with him a lion skin, another's shield showed the titan Prometheus and his fire, one man's shield, the messenger explains, was covered in snakes that... Quote, held in their jaws Theban children they were seizing from the walls. Yes, he's essentially confirming it's dark out there. With this, the messenger tells Jocasta and the audience of the battle that has taken place before the Theban walls and on them. He tells of all the blood that's been spilled, all those who have already died, so much violence, and it's only just begun. One man, Capaneus, attempted to scale the walls of Thebes. He climbed a ladder hidden under his shield, avoiding the blows of the Thebans who attempted to defend their walls. But as he got higher, he got more sure of himself. In the end, he was hit with one of Zeus's lightning bolts, thrown from the ladder, limbs flailing like Ixion's wheel, blood spilled on the earth. So, the messenger says, so far we have kept the walls of Thebes from being broken, have kept the city safe and unharmed, but that was only today, and who knows how long it will last. He finishes, quote, but for now, one of the gods has kept us safe. Jocasta is relieved to hear that her sons are safe, though the tragedy of poor Manichaeus hits home. She feels for her brother, who she sees as being affected by Oedipus's curse. What are my sons planning next? She asks the messenger. 
She's glad they're alive for now, but can't imagine they're not plotting something against one another. The messenger refuses to tell Jocasta their plans, instead trying to distract her by emphasizing that everything is fine now, so isn't that enough? They're alive now, so why worry? Of course, Jocasta is no dummy, and she knows this is a cop-out. She can tell he's trying to hide something. Finally, she says, quote, You will tell it unless you can fly up into the sky. Fine, the messenger consents. He'll tell Jocasta what he's been trying to keep secret. Her two sons have come to an agreement, proposed by Ateocles. There's no reason for so many Thebans nor Argives to die in the battle, Ateocles has announced to both armies, not when there is a solution staring them all in the face. Ateocles and Polynices will fight each other, one-on-one, hand-to-hand combat. No one else needs to die. If Ateocles wins, he will retain the throne of Thebes. If Polynices wins, Ateocles will give it up. Simple as that, except that at least one of her sons will likely die at the hand of the other. At this tragic news, Jocasta calls to her daughter, Antigone. To be clear, yes, that Antigone. From here, much of Sophocles' more famous play, Antigone, is covered, though with some variations, much like Euripides' version of this story as a whole. Jocasta calls to Antigone to come with her, to help her mother attempt to dissuade her brothers from their plan to fight, for one to die at the other's hands, if not worse. Come, quickly, she tells Antigone, who is a bit hesitant to head out onto the battlefield with her, leaving behind the room she's meant to stay in as a still unmarried woman of Thebes. But she is brave, the women of Thebes are strong. She agrees because, like Jocasta, she wants to save her brothers if she can. As they leave, Jocasta makes it clear. Hurry, Antigone, because if I get there before they hurt each other, then I can go on living with them. But if I fail and we get there too late, I will follow them to their death. Ay, 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 the chorus calls out. This is the sound of mourning in Greek tragedy and beyond, the sound of grief and fear. Ay, ay. Once more, the chorus laments the tragedy that has befallen the city of Thebes and that which will certainly continue to take place. They are the ones through which we get the real emotional crux of the play. They are the ones able to see just how very sad it all is, how all-encompassing the fate of this city, but more specifically, of this family. At this, poor Creon arrives, holding the body of his son, Manichius, who gave his life for the safety of the city. Creon is looking for his sister, for Jocasta, to help him lay out his son for the funeral. Of course, she's not there, and the chorus tells him as much. They tell him that she's gone to try to save her sons, after the death of his. We're meant to understand now that, once more, time has passed between scenes. Creon has already gone to where his son had died, mourned him, and brought him to the palace. Meanwhile, Jocasta and Antigone have been gone too, for some time. The chorus tells Creon that they imagine the fight between brothers has already occurred. And with that statement, the messenger appears to confirm their fear. The sons of Thebes, Ateocles, and Polynices are dead. Creon, taking in this news so shortly after the death of his own son, thinks he's heard the worst tragedy imaginable. But no, the messenger tells him, there's worse to come. Not only are both Ateocles and Polynices dead, but with them went their mother, Creon's sister, Jocasta. To this, the chorus responds, quote, Raise a wall, raise a wall of women beating their hands over their head. 
Creon mourns his sister, once more giving her respect that she's lacked in the other tellings of this story. Poor Jocasta, he says, an awful way to have your life ended, an awful end to the marriage you'd already suffered from. Once more, Jocasta is not at fault. She was a victim to fate and to curses, and even in that, she did her absolute best to be a good mother, a good queen of Thebes. Creon, in Euripides' version, sees the worth in his sister, sees her importance and her power. But, he asks of the messenger, how did this happen? The two brothers met on the battlefield to fight one another. Their armies watched, but the battle was only for them. Both prayed to their respective goddesses that he may take the life of his own brother. Polynices prayed to Hera, since he had married into her land of Argos. Ateocles prayed to Athena, the goddess of the city of Thebes, who had helped Cadmus found it those generations before. The pair fought, and were so evenly matched that for a long time neither got in any blows— Once one of them did, the other followed. Finally, both wounded, they came together shield to shield, each standing firm. But Ateocles got the upper hand and ultimately wounds Polynices badly. Thinking it's a mortal wound, Ateocles throws down his sword and makes to strip his brother of his armor. But it wasn't mortal. And so with that misstep, Polynices stabs his brother through the liver. They both fall to the earth drowning in their own blood, lying side by side. This is when poor Jocasta arrives on the scene, crying out to her two sons. She throws herself on them while Antigone looks on, heartbroken. Neither son is dead at this point, and both are able to look towards their mother, sticky with their blood. Ateocles isn't able to speak, but he shows his mother his love through the tears in his eyes. Polynices, though, is able to express his regret over all of it, saying that even in death he still loves his brother. He asks that he be buried in Thebes with his family, even though the city is angry with him. He asks her to convince them to allow it, even after all he's done. When Jocasta sees that both her sons have died and at each other's hands— She takes up a sword and thrusts it through her own neck. All the while, Antigone watched. She listened to her brother's last words, seen her mother's reaction. The truce was over then, though the Thebans were able to attack first, killing Argives and winning the battle spurred by the death of both of their leaders. Now the bodies of the Theban dead were being brought forth by the survivors, by Antigone. That Jocasta dies in this way is yet another ode to her importance in this telling of the story. She doesn't die by hanging, as in Sophocles, relegated to a line in a tragedy that is ultimately all about Oedipus. She dies after hearing the last words of her son, witnessing both of them dead, fighting for their city. This is a noble death, a heroic death. It's the death that men would experience on the battlefield, not usually one meant for women. The story is a tragedy after all, so it isn't shocking that Jocasta would still die, but in giving her this death, Euripides is really making up for the much more famous version. This Jocasta, even in her death, is the star of the show. Antigone leads the procession of the dead, at the head of which are her mother and her two brothers. She is solemn and severe, She makes clear she is not veiling herself now, not hiding, and therefore no longer a girl. It's symbolic. She has grown into a woman with these events, with what she's witnessed. She says, quote, I carry myself along a backhand of the dead. Now it is Antigone lamenting the fate of the Thebans rather than the chorus, but the laments are the same, the curse, their fates, the horrible sphinx and all the death and destruction ultimately caused. 
She calls out over the death of her brothers, their fates, the whole mess that is the royal family of Thebes, the Cadmians. Finally, she calls upon her father for the first time in the play, revealing Oedipus, he who, in Euripides' telling, is the real curse upon the city of Thebes. So Oedipus arrives, asking Antigone why she's called him. She tells him, Your sons and your wife are dead. Your wife who always helped you, who loved you. She tells him, in essence, it's your fault. Your curse upon your family for locking you away. Your curse for being there at all. For all that happened long before this. Now from here, along with two other sections earlier in the play, it appears that many who study this and Euripides in general agree that what remains was added later, not by Euripides, but still in ancient times and therefore was viewed by ancient audiences. The earlier sections that are likely additions are the naming of the seven commanders attacking the seven gates and the long speech where Eteocles arms himself. Both, as I understand it, are derivatives either of Aeschylus and his more famous Seven Against Thebes or the Children of Heracles by Euripides. Beyond those sections, it seems the rest of the play, after Antigone is angry with her father, was also added by somebody other than Euripides. And that Euripides might have ended with Oedipus and Antigone's exchange just there. It seems right to me that Oedipus would end it more along the lines of Antigone lamenting the fate of her family, calling upon Oedipus to see what he's caused, and much of this does seem somewhat out of place. But of course, because of the way it's done, if it was done at all, it's hard to tell if Euripides would have ended it there, or if he had another ending that was removed or changed. Regardless, I'm going to tell you the rest of the play, but I wanted to point out that the rest of this might not be Euripides. Taking charge and insisting that it's time for the funerals, Creon tells Oedipus that he can no longer stay in Thebes. He explains that Ateocles put him in charge in the event of all of this, that Hymon will marry Antigone, thus continuing the family line of Thebes, but importantly, Creon fears that only more tragedy will befall them all the longer Oedipus is permitted to stay there. In response, well, Oedipus seems to make it all about him. At least it sounds that way. He explains his fate, everything that happened to him, even though we already well know his childhood and how he got to where he was. He laments that he now has nobody to guide him in life since he is blind. Who's going to do it, he asks, not his wife, not his sons. It simply isn't about you, Oedipus. From there, we're brought back to the issue brought up in the last episode, it's been explicitly decreed that Polynices is not allowed to be buried in Thebes, and yet with his last words he begged for it. And so here is much of the central plot to Sophocles' Antigone, because Creon repeats now that Polynices cannot be buried within the walls of Thebes, that his body must be left beyond it with nothing done to it. Antigone tells Creon plainly that she will bury her brother there in Thebes, to this, he threatens her with death, that she will lie next to her brother. To me, this all seems another suggestion that Euripides may not have written this bit. Creon is suddenly harsh and heartless, much like the Creon of other versions. He threatens Antigone, he orders her to be dragged away, he loses all of the kind nature that he seemed to have before. Earlier, he'd refused to sacrifice his son, he'd talked about how much he loved him, he brought the boy's body to his sister to mourn with him. That Creon was good. This one is cold and unfeeling. They go on like this, a stichomythia of arguing over the fate of Polynices' body, that quick dialogue back and forth. Antigone now says she won't marry Hymon, that she'll kill him instead. It's messy and seems awkward and unlike the rest of the play. Antigone announces that instead of marrying Hymon, becoming Queen of Thebes, she will take herself into exile alongside her father. With this, Creon leaves Antigone alone with Oedipus, who tries to convince her not to go through with her threat, not to live in exile with him, but to remain in Thebes and marry Hymon, to be happy there. Here, they're more concerned with Oedipus's exile, whether he'll be alone, who will guide him. The burial of Polynices has fallen by the wayside. The father and daughter speak more, discussing their fates, 
Oedipus announces that an oracle foretold he would find his ultimate fate in Colonus, by Athens, and that that's where he would go into exile. It's not clear, by the end, whether Antigone will follow him there, nor whether she will go to all lengths to bury her brother, Polynices, within the walls of Thebes. It's left unclear and unsaid what is the actual end for these characters, so, if that section was added after Euripides had finished the play, after he had died, were they trying to connect it more to the famous plays of Sophocles and Aeschylus? These discussions between Antigone and Oedipus and the debate over Polynices' burial, they link the story back to Sophocles' Antigone and Oedipus at Colonus, which are the two other plays that made up his telling of the story of Thebes. Whatever the end really was, what it was meant to be by Euripides, the story really ended with the death of Jocasta, with her being given a just end, a real end worthy of an important, powerful woman who, in Euripides, got to take back her fate, to take hold of her own destiny, her own story. Oh, nerds, thank you so much for listening, as usual. I do love covering Euripides' plays. And frankly, I wrote a slew of this episode while listening to Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill. Somehow that really added to the process. Originally, I had meant to cover Antigone this month. Sophocles' Antigone, that is. Because many of you have asked for it. But when I learned about this play, the story of Thebes, focusing instead on Jocasta, who's been done so dirty in reception... I decided that it was a much better take. While in theory I could cover Antigone in the future, it would be a lot of the same story covered here. It's just that Sophocles focuses on Antigone, but he also focuses on her in a way that isn't particularly innovative, at least for our purposes. It's been really overdone in pop culture in more modern respects. There are so many movies based on Antigone. Her story has been told so many times. I just don't see it as necessary. She too has been misappropriated, but often in a way that makes her more than she is in the myth. I don't want to go into it too much, and I haven't done that much digging, maybe another day. But for now, it's Jocasta who really interests me. After all, all of this revolves around her entirely. And to have her die so early in the story of Thebes, as in Oedipus Tyrannos, feels like a real blow to her character and to her story takes away a lot of her agency, her power, her glory. All to say, I'm thrilled to have covered this version instead. It's tragic, yes, but Jocasta gets her due. She gets a story and agency and power. She gets to be the hero in her own tragedy. Now, as I've mentioned before, I've racked up a few too many Women's History Month recordings with brilliant people in the field, so you'll actually be seeing some additional bonus episodes this month, because why the hell not? Later this week, the partial historians give us a crash course in Cleopatra the Seventh, and I speak with Sarah Richer, the illustrator of our upcoming book, Greek Mythology, the Gods, Goddesses, and Heroes Handbook. Sarah and I had never actually spoken before, but we're pretty sure we were separated at birth. Thank you all so much. As usual, a rating and review would be so very appreciated, but only if you want to give me a good one. Otherwise, zip it, nerds. You're all the best. I am Liv, and I absolutely love this shit.